All right, hello Nulcom. Today's talk is Zero Day Up Your Sleeve Attacking Macos Environments. My name is Wojciech Regua, and I'm a head of mobile security at Securing, where I'm mostly focused on iOS and macOS application security. Um, in my free time, I run a blog, wojciechregua.blog, uh, which is about, of course, Apple security. So if you are interested in this topic, feel free um, to visit my blog. Um, some of you may also know me from iOS Security Suite that I'm a creator of. It's a free Swift open source library uh, that helps developers and security teams making sure that their mobile application is compliant with uh, OWASP mobile application security verification framework checks. And recently, we also started in securing a new service that is macOS environment security testing. Uh, so let's go to the agenda. And before I'll introduce you to this talk, um, I had an idea in my mind before I started creating this talk uh, that I'd like to give uh, like typical red teaming talk, but red teaming talks are usually about Windows or Linux, but I wanted to give a Mac OS related talk uh, to show you that all these techniques that you know from attacking Windows or Linux are also possible on Macs, that Macs can also be uh, successfully attacked. All right, so uh, we'll start from a quick introduction. Um, then we'll compare some different um, use cases of Macs in corporate environments. Um, and then we'll start with setting up a C2 with Mephic, and then the standard red teaming uh, procedure that is initial access, persistence, uh, data collection, lateral movement. And because I don't uh, like leaving people without the recommendations, uh, I'll talk a bit about hardening Macos environments and, of course, the conclusion. All right, so I have one question to you, or two questions, but that's the first one. Uh, please raise your hand if there is at least one Mac in your company. All right, so it's like 90% of the audience, I think. That's good. So the second question, please raise your hand if that Mac has access to your company resources like other Windows machines. Okay, like, I think, like, almost everybody who raised, rose their hand during the first question rose their hand during the second question, which is good, but because it, it, it proves that <clears throat> my assumptions were, were correct. All right, so why did I decide to make this talk? Um, because Macs are getting more common in corporate environments. Uh, they are widely used by developers, UX, designers, managers, etc. Um, in small companies or software houses or gen IT companies in general, um, those companies have a large percent of Macs in their environments. Mm, and those Macs are not symmetrically uh, secured comparing them to Windows machine. I uh, spoke some time ago with, with, uh, uh, with a person that works for a big international bank, and, and he told me, Wojciech, but we don't have any Macs in, in our environment. And I asked, do you really? You, I, I saw you have a mobile banking application for iOS, so how do your developers uh, program it and build it and, and deploy it? And uh, he said, okay, I will return, uh, return to you with, with the answer on that. And after a couple of days, he told me, Yes, uh, actually we have a team, uh, an iOS team that, that, that makes that application. And you know what? Our Macs are not even, uh, the Macs of that developers are not even enrolled to MDM or anything. Uh, you know, they, they bring their own devices that are a blind spot for their socks. <laughs> so that's, that was an interesting conversation. So what are the problems that, uh, we identified, uh, during many uh, macOS environments assessments. So there were old and vulnerable macOS versions everywhere, like everywhere. Um, we had one assessment uh, when I um, audited all the Macs because it was a small company. And it turned out that the person responsible for financing that company used Macs, used Mac not updated for three or four years. And you know, Macs also have vulnerabilities, right? Um, 
by default, uh, macOS system firewall is disabled. So if there is nobody who uh, forces people to turn on their firewalls, especially non-technical people, uh, the Macs probably will be left with the firewall disabled. And anti-malware, do Macs even have viruses? Um, unfortunately, yes, uh, we have to care about it. Um, not even saying about standard users working on admin accounts. Um, and I think that this uh, common in some hardened Windows environments, like this is lack of hardening whitelisting. Like hard, <clears throat> whitelisting of applications is of course in the most hardened Windows environments, but I didn't see in all assessment that we did, we, I didn't see at least once um, corporate environment with the whitelisting on Macs. And in mid-sized companies, uh, Macs are not even enrolled to uh, enrolled in MDMs, so that's really bad. There is no central mechanism to um, to manage those Macs in, in mid-sized companies usually. Okay, so uh, let's compare now uh, three situations where Macs are present in corporate environments. So the first scenario is that Macs are directly bound to the AD. So there is a classic Active Directory environment with Windows machines. Uh, there are mostly Windows machines, and some of the developers, managers, etc., uh, use Macs, and those Macs uh, are natively bound to the AD. But that's the most rare situation, to be honest, from, from my experience. Uh, the second one, uh, a bit more common, is that, all right, so this company has um, an active directory environment. Um, those Macs are not bound to the AD, uh, but they have somehow to access uh, resources using the Kerberos. So there is an application, an extension called Nomad, that handles uh, Kerberos for you. So the user provides user or the admin uh, provides the AD credentials to, Kerbero, to, to Nomad and it generates the, the whole uh, Kerberos communication. And the third one uh, observed in, in modern uh, companies is that there is no Active Directory, just one SSO, like for example Okta. And uh, via this SSO, the, the person gets access to all the services used by, by the company that are, of course, in the cloud. So there is, AD is not necessary in this scenario. Okay, but for this talk, uh, we will focus on such an environment. So we will be attacking a Mac um, that via OpenVPN uh, has access to internal company resources. Uh, it uses Nomad to um, to talk to Active Directory, and then via Active Directory, it gets access to uh, Google Workspace or Jira software. Um, this uh, this this Mac also uses AWS. There are tokens stored. Um, has a browser in this case Firefox uh, that connects to to Twitter, Facebook, or other social media, and that's usually a common case, uh, especially for marketing teams, uh, because usually marketing uh, department works on their private account linked to the company account, and it's you know not really good to. Uh, to bind your private accounts to the company's SSO. So usually the connection to, to social media is out of Kerberos. It's out, out of SSO. It's, it's a like typical connection to, to, to social media services, not via the company infrastructure. Uh, so there will be, uh, for example, stored password for social media accounts on, on such a machine. And that company heard that Signal is a secure messenger, so we'll be attacking Signal on those Macs. And of course, there will be some secret data stored in desktop or other TCC protected directories. All right, so in order to, uh, to perform this attack, um, we will be using Mythic. That's a really great red teaming framework with an extensive macOS support. Uh, it's open source, it's created by Cody Thomas. Um, I really love Mythic because, as I told you, it's open source. It has really extensive docs, so it's really easy to set up. Uh, not 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 really common, so <clears throat> it's not really detected for now. Okay, so let me show you a quick demo. So we have the, the Mythic set up already. We we'll log into Mythic. 
that's the main dashboard. Uh, we have one payload that is upfill, the standard one, and C2 profile uh, that is HTTP. Uh, so let's create a new payload. It's really simple, generate new payload. We select the, the operating system of the target, of course, macOS in our case, AppFell, the, um, the default one. Uh, we select all the comments that will be accessible. And we decide to use the simplest connection as HTTP, not the with the SSL. We provide the, the callback host. We click next, create payload, and now we can download it and, and use it to, to attack the, <clears throat> the victim. All right, but uh, there, are, there are some problems on how can we get the initial access. So according to Apple, all the software downloaded directly with your browser, or in general from the internet, must be notarized. And uh, it's the case for macOS applications, non-app bundles, disk images, flat installer packages. So most of the co co common um, <coughs> uh, stuff that executes your code on your machines, right? Um, and what's that notarization? So notarization requires uh, developers to have a um, developer ID. Um, the paid one, and to um, distribute um, their application. But before they, they, they can distribute their applications, they have to upload it to Apple. The application has to meet some uh, requirements, the security policies, and it's verified against, against the um, malicious code if there is, there is some malicious code in, in those applications. But you may ask me, all right, but what happens if I don't notarize my, my, my application or my payload? Um, so unfortunately, macOS will block it. Uh, there will be a prompt that uh, no notarized app cannot be opened because the developer cannot be verified. So we have to somehow bypass it. So this is the talk, uh, this is what the talk is, uh, this talk is about. Um, so let's find some solutions. We can, of course, buy uh, a proper developer certificate, create a legit PKG file, notarize it, but we are risking our certificate to be revoked, right? Uh, so <laughs> there, is, there is the second solution, uh, commonly used by, by current malware. So um, we can provide our payload uh, bundled in a DMG file. And DMG file is a, is a disk image where we can set the, the background of. So as you can see here, that's, that's an example of real malware. Uh, there is a background with an instruction to the victim on how to bypass their, uh, how, how to make the victim bypass their own security mechanisms, right? So the, the malware uh, asks the user to right click on the, on the package, unsigned package, and click open. And there will be a prompt that the application was downloaded from the internet, it, it wasn't verified by Apple, so please click OK and then, you know, risk your Mac hacked. And so that's the, that's the, that's the second idea. Uh, the third idea, uh, because this talk is about zero days, um, we can find um, a gatekeeper bypass. A uh, gatekeeper is that mechanism that on macOS side verifies if the application was indeed notarized. Um, so we can bypass it uh, with a zero day. I even find one uh, one year ago, uh, but it's fixed. And we have the fourth technique, and that's the technique you probably know from attacking Windows. That's a technique that involves Microsoft Word. On Microsoft Word, uh, there is also uh, macros, uh, macro possibility attack. Uh, so we have a visual basic and uh, auto open subroutine, which will be executed after user opens that doc file and allows macros. Um, and in that subroutine, uh, we can call mac script uh, that in the end um, will will execute our bash commands. So in that case, I just uh, download the, uh, our, our payload created with Mythic, and I run it with also script. All right, so 
let's assume that that user downloaded it and and clicked um, enable macros. The code has been executed, but the problem is that Microsoft Word is sandboxed. So even if we use that trick with macros, um, our our remote shell will be not that cool because it will be still run in a sandbox process context. Uh, so we can do you know a limited stuff on on that machine. However, there is there is another bypass for it, uh, made by Matt Habat that shared a really cool technique uh, that allows us to escape word sandbox. However, it requires the user to reboot their Max. So it's it's good technique, especially when you know, for example, that Apple will push some updates and you can infect the machines right before that update. So you will be sure that most of the users, maybe if it's enforced, for example, will reboot their Macs. But you know, it's not like 100% effective. We'd like to see something um, more effective. So we have our own zero days. And I now present a Maca Sandbox Escape vulnerability. Unfortunately, it's not uh, fixed. Uh, so I won't share you the, the, the actual code. So you have to trust me that the, 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 this, this demo is real. <coughs> All right, so this, this zero day is for um, the whole standard macOS sandboxing um, <coughs> mechanism. It's not only for escaping the word, but it's the, for the whole standard sandboxing mechanism. So let's see how it works. So the user clicks on the document file, clicks enable macros. And as you can see, we have now an active callback. We can now use it. We, I wrote shell. I come on to the mythic and now we can execute any shell command we want. So let's start with who am I? Vuragula, that is my user. And now let's try with ls. Uh, the user's directory, which if succeeds means that uh, we have unsandboxed uh, code execution. Yeah, so we can see uh, two users, which means that our code is now unsigned and unsandboxed run by the victim. That's good. We have the initial access. Now let's talk um, about the persistence. So. On macOS, uh, there are a bunch of typical persistence techniques like launch agents, launch demons, login items, cron jobs, uh, and tons of others. My friend Chaba Fields documented it on his blog. So it is now like 27 or something uh, persistence techniques documented. So it's quite a lot. Uh, but in this talk, we'll use the standard one. So we uh, pass the persist uh, launch to the uh, command to the mythic. And now with the OSA script, the very same command that I used in the word macros, we will be uh, running the, um, the payload created by mythic, right? We can change the label to look more stealthy. And click task. Let's wait a while for the mythic to, uh, to create the launch agent. It's, as you can see, uh, the file has been written. So now the second step because now we we, we registered the, the launch agent but now we'd like to load it and that's simple we just take the um the path again shell launch ctl load and that path click task and in a while you will see that we will have the second active callback yeah the second one so now we have unsandboxed, um, unsigned code execution on Mac with persistence, right? So even if the victim reboots their computer, we'll be still able to connect to that um, reverse shell. All right, um, a quick update. Um, in macOS Ventura that will be released this fall, um, 
there will be a new tab in, in, in general settings uh, that will show all the launch agents and launch demons registered in, in macOS. So this technique is will be not that stealthy anymore. However, as I told you, there are plenty of different techniques and Apple covers maybe three or four of them uh, in that vein. So just switch to another persistent technique. It's, it's really easy to do so. Great. So we have uh, taken over the, uh, the Mac. Now let's focus on the data collection, right? So we are interested mostly in VPN credentials, AD credentials, signal messages, browser cookies, keychain entries, AWS or other cloud keys, and desktop and document files. Let's start with OpenVPN. Um, so OpenVPN uh, starts um, stores its profiles in application support directory that can be accessed without any additional privileges. Like standard macOS user can access it uh, without providing any password. It's not encrypted. Um, so if the, all the credentials required to establish a VPN connection are there, you, you, that's it. Uh, but usually, uh, the, the, the profiles don't store, uh, user login and password. So, uh, we have profile, but we still need to, uh, to steal the user's login and password, right? Um, because of the notarization, uh, applications have to have the hardened runtime there on. So we cannot easily inject to those applications. However, on purpose, Developers can disable some of the security mechanisms for their applications. And that's the OpenVPN does. It's another kind of zero day. Um, it has the two uh, problematic entitlements. The first one is allow dealt environment variables. And the second one is disable library validation. So with that knowledge um, of those two entitlements, we can now inject our dynamic library inside of the of the open vpn context and yeah we can um for example st steal keychain entries uh that open vpn stores or uh launch a keylogger inside of the of the of the open vpn so why couldn't i use a global keylogger because on new macOS versions, uh, if you'd like to register a system-wide keylogger, it requires a special permission from the user. There will be a prompt that the application wants to record all user input. And we'd like to avoid it. But, you know, if you are in the context of an application, you can get all the keystroke that user passes to the application without any additional privileges because it would, you know, don't have any sense to, 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 to do so. It's, it's, um, expected behavior, right? So the application may catch the, the user keystrokes, right? So I created an open source keylogger uh, that you can download from my GitHub. Uh, it's on GIST. It's a really short code. Mm. And with the dealt insert libraries, uh, we can inject to uh, to the open VPN and wait for the user logins and password. And that's how uh, we can steal the VPN credentials from, from user. Again, it didn't require from us any additional privileges, like just standard user. <laughs> nice. So we have OpenVPN uh, taken over. Now let's go to, to Nomad. And Nomad saves your Active Directory credentials in macOS Keychain. And the Keychain has a flow that allows getting entries from it without any prompt user root access or user passwords. Um, I documented it in my blog post, so if you are interested, uh, how did it work, uh, feel invited to, uh, to read that post. However, I also open sourced a, a Nomad's credential stealer tool, um, that will do all the job for you. So it's, it's pretty simple. You just run the Nomad's, Nomad credential stealer application and it will dump the Active Directory credentials right from the keychain without raising any, uh, any prompt. Again, no additional privileges. Standard user. So, because we were able to uh, get all of the credentials from the macOS keychain, we are now able to access all the company's resources that are hidden 
um, after uh, behind the ADF SSO, right? Okay, now let's torture Signal. Who thinks that Signal is secure? Raise your hand. Okay. Um, I hope so as well, uh, that Signal is secure. Uh, but the thing with Signal is that Signal claims that they protect your data only in transit. They don't care about your endpoint security. So all your messages on Mac from Signal are encrypted. There is a database, an SQLite free database that's encrypted. However, what about the key? Um, the key is not stored in the keychain. It's stored in a flat file accessible by a standard user. So you go to the library sup uh, application support signal config JSON, you grab the key, pass to the da SQLite database, and we have all your messages unencrypted. Yeah. So the next target is, is Firefox. So Firefox stores saved logins and passwords in an encrypted form, that's good. But if the master password is not set, that is a default configuration, the safe credentials can be dumped again without root. And personally, who of you uses Firefox? Okay. And do you have the master password set? No, nobody does it. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, there is a tool uh, on GitHub uh, made by Unode that's called Firefox Decrypt, and I will show you a quick demo on how it works. So you run it with Python, select profile, and you're done. No additional privileges again. Great. So AWS and desktop and other protected resources are left, so let's now focus on the TCC. Um, so whenever you install a new application on Mac uh, that will require your camera access or screen share, so for example, maybe Microsoft Teams or, or Google Meet or anything, um, when the application tries to access those resources, those protective resources like camera, etc., uh, for the first time, there will be a prompt. Mm. And that, that prompt uh, is, is a protection of your uh, privacy-sensitive data. Uh, and the, the mechanism behind of that prompt is called TCC. And now, uh, TCC protects a lot of sensitive resources like camera, calendar, Bluetooth, automation, contacts, um, network shares, uh, photos, music, and many, many more. Even if you <clears throat> have that mythic shell and you will try to, for example, uh, do the list of desktop and click task, you will see that there will be a prompt, and if the user clicks don't allow, the operation will be not allowed. Um, and the case is also for, for root, so even if you, if you have root, you cannot bypass this prompt. Uh, Apple decided to make this prompt to be clicked by user with a clear intention. So it has to be done by user, even if there is a root account on Mac, it still th 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 doesn't mean anything. You can't bypass this prompt. You, can, you can't do this. However, uh, there are tons of TCC bypasses. Um, I was uh, co-speaking last year ago on Black Hat uh, in the US about 20 plus ways to bypass your macOS privacy mechanisms. Um, but yeah, that will re that would require zero days. That those vulnerabilities are all now are all now fixed. So we can uh, try abusing other applications that are installed already on macOS, but applications that have the already uh, permissions granted. So there is a problem with Electron apps. 
Uh, yesterday, there was a wonderful talk about abusing Electron remotely. Uh, now, that's a technique that allows abusing Electron locally. So if you are interested, feel free to read it. However, as I promised you to, to show some zero days, uh, there, there, there was a z there, there, this was a zero day, but it was recently fixed by Apple, which is good. Um, so there was a back and launch services that allowed us to bypass the TCC. Um, and I wanted to give you um, some insight on how this exploit worked. But not, unfortunately, I found a bypass for, for that fix, so I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe next time I, I will show the, the full exploit with the, um, <clears throat> with the bypass for the fix. But I will show you a demo to not leave you without <clears throat> anything, right? So let's verify if this macOS is, comp is updated and secure. In that times, it was the newest macOS. The system integrity protection is enabled. Um, we now verify that the application that bypassed TCC by me uh, has no TCC permissions granted, so there is nothing for the bypass TCC by me app. Now let's open it. And there are two buttons made for the proof of concept reasons. We click still address book, and as you can see, it's stolen. And still I message chat that as you can see is stolen. Now let's verify if everything succeeded. So we go to TMP and with file we'll verify if it worked. Yeah, file was able to <coughs> load the both of the data databases. That means that we have bypassed the TCC. Uh, okay. So we have our TCC bypass, um, but there is one more thing. Uh, with the TCC bypass, we were able to allow desktop, um, documents, downloads, and other protected resources. But what about the cloud keys, um, the cloud credentials? Good, good, good news for red teamers. They are stored in home directory, which is not TCC protected. So if you'd like to steal uh, AWS or SSH keys or Azure G Cloud or, or anything that stores uh, their secrets in, in home directory, you don't even have to uh, use any TCC bypasses. It's a directory that's not protected by the TCC. All right, so uh, with all that knowledge, we, uh, we were able to um, fully compromise the macOS machine. And because, as I told you, I don't want you to uh, live without any recommendations, um, there are six points, uh, the, the bare minimum, you have to implement in, in your Macs, uh, macOS infrastructure. The first one is enroll your company's Macs to MDM, maybe Jamf or Intune on any MD one you, uh, you like. Uh, keep them updated because as I proved on the on the presentation that are vulnerabilities for macOS, so please keep, the, keep them updated. And for security policies, like system integrity protection, without system integrity protection, uh, TCC is not even in place. There, there, are no, there, there are no checks. With SIP disabled, uh, you can elevate your privileges to root without providing even a user's password. Uh, so make sure that there are um, policies that are unenforced. Uh, there is an um, in interesting story because, you know, for the last few years when I was, you know, Googling for finding some uh, co example codes on, on macOS or something stopped working, I, of course, uh, Googled for Stack Overflow, right? And in Stack Overflow, there are a lot of recommendations that claim, all right, so you can't run this application because there is notarization. Uh, so let's try disabling SIP and maybe that will work. And there are so many answers on Stack Overflow uh, that misguide users to disable system integrity protection. So you really want to be sure uh, that your organization have um, security policies enforced. Um, disable offices, office macros. Um, 
I can bet that in most cases, if you have modern infrastructure and you have Mac users, they don't even use Mac, Mac, uh, Word, Word macros. Uh, on Mac OS, of course. On or Windows, the finance department um, will probably use them, but most of Mac users, they don't use Word macros. So I bet you can disable it. it. Uh, install an anti-malware solution, EDR or whatever. Uh, Macs have viruses, so they, ha they, they need to be protected. And monitor your Macs, because there is always uh, something that may go wrong, right? Um, if you'd like to verify if your macOS infrastructure or environment is secure, you can always hire us to do this. Mm, we can perform a red teaming for you or, or just assess your, uh, your environment. So you have a contact to me. And to sum up, uh, that will be the shortest sum up ever. Please remember that Macs, like any other machines, have viruses, can be attacked, have to be updated. So please do it and stay safe. Thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? Hey, uh, great talk. So for the uh, Word document that gets downloaded with the macro, mm -hmm. uh, would it get quarantined with the extended attribute flag? And I know there's bypass for that as well, mm -hmm. but at least it's an initial defense. Uh, so Word documents uh, are not quarantined, even if they have the tag applied. Uh, because that would have no sense, right? Because you want to have apps quarantined, like images, uh, like, f of course, uh, disk images, like um, packages, like uh, applications, etc. That's what you want to have quarantined. Uh, but, for example, PNG images or, you know, text files, you... you you don't want to have them signed, you know, in order to open. So there is, a, there is an allow list of extensions uh, that don't have quarantine, and Word documents are one of those uh, non-quarantined extensions. Uh, one more question about the TCC uh, bypass. Uh, I noticed uh, Terminal had access to contacts. I think it's relying on the attribution change of the parent process. In the demo, the the, the, term, the the terminal hack, but what? Which one? Uh, had access to the contacts in mm -hmm. the demo. So is it relying on like the parent process uh, uh, attribution chain? And uh, no, uh, it's <laughs> the, the the story behind this bug is really interesting because I found it really accidentally, and I couldn't believe it worked. It's it's a part of mechanism that I think all of my friends researchers knew about that behavior, and if I, even I knew uh, about this behavior for maybe two years, and, you know, uh, one night I, I, was, I was asleep and I was like, hmm, the, the idea stumbled across my mind, I said, wow, but that shouldn't be working right there, and I went to the computer and it worked, so that, that's really obvious bypass, but I can't, I'm sorry, uh, disclose it today. Does anyone else have any questions? Okay. Uh, hi. Amazing talk. Uh, actually, uh, you. in your sandbox escape t technique, you discuss about the persist launch. I missed that point, like how it works. I, the, the, the sandbox escape, it, it, the, the question was... It, about the mythic uh, persist launch. The persist launch. Yep. Um, that... Um, that technique that was presented that required reboot uh, was via login items, but my sandbox escape, uh, you know, that's not what I can what I can disclose <laughs> about the details regarding this technique. But yes, there is something with Lunge D, but I'm not saying any more, okay. uh, anything more. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nice, thank you. <laughs> Thanks for the talk. Uh, so my question is around the mythic uh, attack uh, could, that you Could you speak a bit louder? Uh, the mythic technique that you showed, wherein the word macro was used. Mm -hmm. uh, so you used a sandbox escaping technique, right? Yes. So were you also able to do anything interesting without sandbox escaping? Like, uh, 
Um, so with Sandbox uh, turned on, you could be able to access only those resources that are available to Word. So it's not really much. You can make connections, you can uh, establish a shell with, uh, with the, with the machine, but it's not really, uh, it's not really worthy, you know. If Word has access to some resources, uh, like, I don't know, camera, but well, it's a rare case, that would be maybe worth something, but Mostly, you, in most cases, you will need to have an unsandboxed code execution. And uh, another follow-up, so uh, have you also seen similar attacks in production, like in the wild, being exploited? Once again? Have you seen similar attacks uh, being exploited in the wild, or is this something? Uh, such such exploits with Word, right? Okay. Uh, yes. Okay, thanks. Any other questions from the back? Okay. First of all, thanks for the talk. It's really fantastic. So I have a doubt related to disabling the SIP. Is it possible to disable the SIP through the tool you showed? Um, in order to disable SIP, uh, you have to reboot your Mac. So no, you can't do it. not from the... Maybe if you have a zero day, yes, but there is no standard technique to do this without having a vulnerability. You have to reboot your Mac to do this. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? So uh, in uh, the organization, some part I have seen uh, when you have to connect critical environment, so they do allow uh, the developers will be still be using Mac machine, but when they have to connect to the to the production environment, they were using some sort of VDI uh, to connect back to the corporate environment. No, so it, it I, I, that's where I see that there is a gap, like metrical security controls are not deployed on those uh, Mac devices because they are not directly connecting to the corporate or to the production environment. So is that something you see reasonable or do you think, okay, there are bypass over the VDIs that can lead to uh, compromise uh, or like uh, someone can get into your uh, crown jewels or your uh, production environment? Um, it really depends, but the answer would be really long for that question, so maybe let's do, do it after, okay? Sure. Uh, any other questions? Okay, thank you. So, the, uh, thanks again, Wojciech. Thanks a lot. So the lunch break is going to start in one minute from 12.45 to 2 p.m. and we'll see you again. Thank you.